Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Aaron McGuire, the CEO of USA Bobsled and Skeleton, also known as USABF. Today, we are going to discuss Bobsled and Skeleton racing down the track. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks. Great to be here. Excited to talk with you a little bit today. Absolutely. We need to start off with some foundation, though, of bobsled and skeleton. And how would you describe these sports? How are they similar? How are they different? Um, what can you tell us so we understand what these sports are? Well, most people know the sport of bobsled from cool runnings. And so that's a great way to, to, to learn about the sport. It's uh, you know, a Disney movie uh, from years ago, but it tracks the Jamaican bobsled team, a very unlikely group of folks that uh, took a bobsled, got involved, and, and competed at the Olymp Olympic Games. And so the two sports, um, bobsled and skeleton, uh, our national governing body, USA Bobsled and Skeleton, oversees the, the, the sports in the United States, the promotion of the sports, uh, recruiting athletes, developing athletes, and ultimately putting a team together to represent the United States at the Olympic Games. And so Bobsled, um, both sports are, sports are available for men and women. Um, on the bobsled side, uh, for men, you've got two men and four men. And so it's a little bit like uh, NASCAR on ice or IndyCar on ice, where you have athletes at the very start that are pushing the sled. And all the tracks are, around the world are roughly a mile long. And it takes about a minute to get down. And the athletes, the teams are going anywhere from... 70 to 80 to 90 miles an hour. And so on the men's side, you have two men and four men. On the women's side, you have a two-woman competition, two women in the sled. And most recently at the 2000 or the 2022 Olympic Winter Games in Beijing, they introduced a new event called the Mono Bob, where it's one athlete pushing the sled and getting in the sled and driving down the track. On the skeleton side, it's you're not in the sled, but you're on the sled. And so athletes described as going down uh, the track, the same track on a cafeteria tray on your belly. And so just like bobsled, at the very start of the track, they're pushing the sled as fast as they possibly can and getting in the track and then driving down. That's actually really interesting, the analogy of the cafeteria tray and then that's probably how a lot of people get their start as children right sledding and and getting that experience and then translating to a track is probably quite different um i think that's really interesting that you mentioned the athletes are traveling 70 to 90 miles an hour that's faster than most vehicles are traveling no seat belts involved tell me what what is that experience like well, it's it's an adrenaline an adrenaline rush every time you go down. Um, the track itself, like I mentioned, is is about a mile long. Uh, you said there's no speed seat belts, and that's absolutely true. No airbag, very little cushioning, and so you have four. In my case, I was I had a chance to represent Team USA um, on the the World Cup and the World Championships back in the early 2000s, and so for me, we had four big guys that are all about 220 pounds pushing the 600 pound sled as fast as you possibly can. And then in a matter of a second or two, jumping in the sled and then getting down for aerodynamics. Wow, that's, timing is incredible with that and coordination, lots of practice. You really have this unique perspective, as you mentioned, being uh, one of the athletes, uh, the former athletes on the USA National Bobsled team. Um, you've, at one point in your career, have, uh, been responsible for the Lake Placid Olympic Training Center, where Bobsled and Skeleton does do some training, and now the CEO of USA Bobsled and Skeleton. So in your long history with the sport, what has changed since you've been an athlete? You know, it's, there's, it's, there's a lot of things that have changed, a lot of things that stayed the same. The tracks have, have been around for years and years and years. Um, the sleds themselves have, have stayed relatively the same, although Technology is is a huge advancement within both the bobsled and, and skeleton sleds. And so we're talking about aerodynamics, the design of the sled, um, and we're talking about the runners that uh, they're like the blades that the, the sleds go down on, on the track. And so um, 
there's 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 a lot of similar similarities between bobsled um, and NASCAR IndyCar, where you have similar specs or similar uh, designs that you have to work within, but every country can can design their own sled. And so every sled around around the world is a little bit different. And so we spent a lot of time in the air, the wind tunnel. Um, we spent a lot of time working with engineers and designers to say, how do we take our sled and redesign it to make it faster, to make it air more aerodynamic, to really give our U.S. athletes a, a competitive advantage against the rest of the world. And I would imagine the manufacturers of these sleds are, you probably have a limited choice, limited selection of who you can work with, right? So, <laughs> yeah, that's correct. We unfortunately can't go down to the sporting goods store and pick up a bobsled or skeleton sled. And so there really, um, there aren't necessarily manufacturers in the United States. In fact, there, there aren't any in the United States. Um, back in the early 90s, uh, a NASCAR driver by the name of Jeff Bodine uh, got interested in in the sport of bobsled, and he went to Lake Placid, where one of the, the two tracks in in the United States is, and tried out a sled, and and went down the track, and and everybody was excited because there's a NASCAR driver there, and so he went down the track, and and his second time down, the sled flipped, he crashed the sled, and and it broke, and he got out of the sled, and he felt you know very sorry about it, and said, hey, can I can I replace your sled? Can I buy you a new sled? And so the athletes at the time said, okay, here's the company in Germany that you can buy the sled from. And they said, no, no, I want to buy you an American sled. And they, they said, we, you know, there aren't any manufacturers. Nobody in the United States makes bobsleds. And so that got him really involved in the sport of bobsled and said, this is ridiculous that, you, that the United States sends a team to the Olympic Games and they're using Germany's equipment or, or other equipment from over, overseas in Europe. And so he started a project called uh, the, the Bodine Project. And so he led it with some of his engineers that worked with him on the NASCAR team. And throughout the early 90s or the, the mid 90s and the early 2000s, designed a fleet of two man and four man sleds. And the U.S. had gone through uh, a number of Olympic Games uh, without earning a medal or uh, without earning a gold medal. And so with his help and his team's help through the Bodine project was able to de design a sled that the U.S. team won medals and ultimately won a, won a medal in, in the four-man bobsled. And, and can you now say that these sleds are manufactured in the, U the U.S. of A? We're bringing it back. We are. We are. <laughs> so we were, we were fortunate to, to have those sleds and, and be part of that project. Uh, but since that time, those sleds have, have um, we're still using them but the rest of the world has designed much faster sleds. Mm -hmm. And so we're now in, in the process of redesigning and, and starting a made in the USA, USA sled project again, that's primar primarily based out of North Carolina, which is home for, for NASCAR. And so we work with a lot of uh, partners that are, that are based in North Carolina to be building the next generation of bobsleds that we'll be uh, using in 2026 uh, at the Winter Olympic Games in Italy, and then 2030. I imagine transporting the sleds are probably pretty challenging. You get used to the sled that you're um, used to dealing with, used to practicing in, and how do you actually get it from one competition to the next? Yeah, it's not an inexpensive sport because the equipment's expensive. Uh, shipping, shipping costs are ex extremely expensive, and so we've been fortunate to have uh, a partner in the United States called JRC who does all of our shipping. Um, for the team domestically, but internationally, it can be expensive. And so we we get these giant containers that you'll see at shipping shipping yards. And our our athletes, um, one of the things that people don't necessarily know about is you think of NASCAR, IndyCar, and there's a whole pit crew that travel around with the team. And so the pilot, the driver shows up and the car's sitting there and it's ready to go and they climb in and they, they do their training and they do their, their race. For us, our athletes are the pit crew. And so they're the ones that are responsible for getting all the equipment together, uh, loading it up into the shipping containers. And when they arrive in, in, in Europe, uh, the first thing they do, they don't go to the hotel and sleep and get a good night's sleep. They go right to shipping and receiving. They pick up their own vans um, and they unload the shipping containers and unload the sleds into the trucks and they drive to the first the first race. They wow. get to the first location, they unload everything, unpack it, then they get their first night of sleep and, and they start training the next morning. 
I guess then they don't have to entrust the responsibility for the care for <laughs> getting it from uh, the shipping destination to the, the the venue, the race venue. So you mentioned technology is one of the things that maybe has improved since you were an athlete, um, but you've also, your sport and everyone in the world have gone through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know you took the helm at, at, as the CEO of um USA bobsled and skeleton right about that time and you had to send some athletes to compete at the 2022 winter olympic games under some strict covid protocols you mentioned kind of going to mono mono bob is, is one of the options of what happened during the pandemic but talk to me about the biggest challenges navigating through covid yeah you're right i started during covid and, and this is a time that obviously nobody expected and and so it was a challenge for for everybody, but but coming into a new role, learning the new role, understanding the organization was was certainly a, a challenge. And so, um, one of the challenges that really presented itself was how do we continue to to raise awareness of the sport and recruit new athletes? Because um, most people know about the sports bobsled and skeleton during the games, but they don't necessarily think about it during the off years. And we'll often have folks come up to us. Olympic year and say, oh, is, is the bobsled team starting to train? And I'm thinking, oh, they've been training for the last four years or eight years. And it's a it's a full-time commitment for for the athletes and the coaches and and for the organization. So we're we're working on it every day, 365 days a year. Mm. And so we knew that we had to bring new talent into the program. We knew that we had to identify athletes. And so we couldn't just stop our recruiting efforts. And so historically, we would travel around the United States and, and host combines on, similar to the NFL, where we invite athletes to come out. They do a series of tests, sprints, jumps, um, really testing power, speed, and explosive uh, athleticism. And and those are really the, the, the key elements of both bobsled and skeleton. And so we looked at some different platforms that were out there, looked at some potential partners, and connected with one that was called GMTM Game Time. And at the time, they were they were doing online recruiting for the sport of football, where athletes could upload a profile, upload videos for football, and they could have scouts look at those football, you know, football, potential football athletes. And so we had the idea of working with them that let's take the same platform and apply it to the sport of bobsled and skeleton. And so when faced with COVID, we were able to take what we had traditionally done in, in person and, and make it virtual. And that really opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for athletes, no matter where they lived. And you often think, oh, you know, there's two tracks in the United States, Lake Placid, New York, and Park City, Utah. So all the athletes are from those two locations. Well, the reality is most athletes that come into the sport of bobsled or skeleton actually did a different sport beforehand. Nobody really grows up being a bobsled. You know, very few athletes grow up being a skeleton athlete. Most of them played football or ran track and field or played volleyball, played baseball. And they did it throughout high school and, and many went on and competed at the university level. And so um, a lot of the athletes that we work with were have been training for the sport of bobsled or skeleton their entire life and they don't necessarily even realize it. And so by being able to push out the virtual combine, we had athletes all over the country applying and, and we were able to assess kind of what their background was where they were as an athlete, what kind of training. And then eventually, once we were able to get back in person, start do training in, in person, they were able to attend the training camps and, and become part of the team. And you're, you're kind of recruiting people from other sports. There's not really this grassroots program that, that people are growing up participating in the sport. Um, so other than the, like the physical attributes that you mentioned or the power and, and physical things that you're looking for in your combine, um, competitions, what other backgrounds have lent the success for athletes? What else have you looked for in, uh, in, in recruiting athletes? Well, for, for our push athletes, I mean, that's, those are the powerhouse athletes of the bobsled team. I mean, they're the, the start, there's really three components to being successful in the sport of bobsled. The start, the technology, which we, which we talked about and the ability to drive a sled down the track. And the difference between first and second place or first and third place is tenths of a second and sometimes hundreds of a second. So a little bit of the aerodynamics, a uh, tenth of a, of a faster start time or, or a better track down the, down the runway is, is 
you know, has an impact on whether you're getting a medal or not. And so for our push athletes, we're, we're definitely looking for, for big, strong, fast athletes. For our pilots that, that drive the sled going down, and, and a lot of times people say, oh, you just kind of sit in, and it's like sledding when I was a kid. You just sit in and just go down for the ride. But there's a lot more to it, and especially for our pilot, because they've got to know every single track around the world, and they're all different. they got to know the number of turns. Do they turn left? Do they turn right? When do you come into a turn? When do you come out? And so we have had some success with, with downhill ski racers making that transition because they understand curves, they understand going around turns, they understand getting apexes within those curves. And so we've had some downhill ski racers that have gone into bobsled and skeleton and, and been very successful and, and win medals at the Olympic Games. And what about for the sport of skeleton? Is there a certain type of athlete that has come from a different sport that has been found to be successful? Well, skeleton athletes come from a lot of different sports as well. Uh, but the same, the same components are, are, are just as important. So the start, the technology, the sled, and, and being able to steer. Um, it's an individual sport. So a lot of athletes that get into skeleton have a track and field background because they're used to that individual sport. Um, and then you got to be willing to take on some, some, you know, some thrills because unlike bobsled, you're laying on your belly and you're going head first down the track. And so yeah. um, we've got some athletes that come out to the track for both bobsled and skeleton. They do it the first time. And some athletes say, how can I get back to the top of the track as quickly as possible to do that again? And we have other athletes that say, how can I get back to the airport to go home as quickly as possible? <laughs> Those it's a athletes. defining moment. <laughs> it really is. It really is. So those well, that get the... to the bottom of the track and just, you know, are thrilled and you can see it light up on their face, you know, the, those are the ones that will be in the sport for a while. And for those who stick with it, mental health is a really important piece of the puzzle while they're training. Like you mentioned, sometimes the, the public at large tend to forget about the sport um, with without the Olympics. Um uh, approaching and talk to me about mental health of athletes while they're training. And then of course, once they retire and leave the sport. Yeah. So, so uh, mental health is, is very important, just like all sports there. And, and uh, you're right uh, for three of the four years, we're primarily under the radar. Now we'd like it to be, we'd like to be front and center and we, we promote ourselves and promote the athletes and the team and the sports as, as often as possible. But um, like most sports, athletes have defining moments within their careers. Um, injury is a big one. Um, end of the season is another. And then at the end of their career, that's that's a challenge as well. And so during each of those times, athletes will kind of be asking themselves and looking inward to say, is this, you know, during injuries and the end of the season, is this something that I want to continue? And how they bounce back after those um those two times of their athletic career really have an impact on, on who they end up being at, as a person and, and how they handle that transition. And so you think about an athlete who, it, like I mentioned, it's, it's a full-time commitment. And so their identity is, is wrapped up a lot of times in, in what they do and, and being a bobsled or skeleton athlete and trying to be the best in the world. And so for, for many of our athletes, we're, during the off season, we're encouraging them to, to get out and do, do a lot and, and, you know, have friendships, get, you know, spend time with family, um, pick up hobbies uh, because that does help with those transition times. And then one of the things that we've done uh, as an organization, and this is one of the things that we, we, we've heard a lot of feedback from athletes and, and it's, it's a difficult one, difficult one for, for all sports. And that's, that's that retirement or that transition of, of being an athlete to, kind of life after being an athlete, and whether that becomes, you become a, a parent or you start a new career, you start your professional career or, you know, get into, get into coaching or stay within, within the sport. It's a challenge. And so um, one of the things that, that we've recognized or that we know helps out a lot is um, really recognizing the athletes themselves and, and what they put into the sport. And while we recognize, and we know that not all athletes can, be Olympic medalists. We know that all athletes can take something positive from the sport, and and we 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 work with the athletes. And a lot of times, you'll you'll talk to an athlete and you say, "Well, what did you learn while you're while you're a bobsledder?" And they say, "Well, we learned I learned how to flip sleds. I learned how to 
sand runners. I learned how to push a sled, <laughs> how to go down a track. The technical pieces. Say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I, I hear hear what you're saying, but what I hear is that you learn hard work, work ethic. You learn a technical skill of flipping a sled or, or driving a sled. You learn how to work as a team. You learn how to set goals. And those are all qualities. Those are all skills that no matter what you get into after being a, an athlete, you can you can take and apply to being successful as a parent, being successful as in your professional career, being successful as a coach. And so it's reframing that and and talking about those positives that can set you up for success. You mentioned so being a competitor in the early 2000s. Did you have the same kind of support and guidance to help you transition from the sport? You know, I, I was fortunate that that I made a, a quick transition from, from being an athlete to working at USA Track and Field. And so I didn't have a whole lot of downtime in between. And so that that helped out with my with my transition. But but one of the things you know that we really like like to do is is recognize those athletes, thank them for their their commitment, their involvement in the sport. And then we're fortunate to have a great alumni system of athletes that were sliders, you know, dating back to the 80s and 90s. And so what we try and do is is present opportunities for those folks to get together, talk about their experiences, you know, relive some of the glory days and tell some of the stories and and share that and and um, provide some some resources for athletes to to help with that with that transition. Kind of like the reunion centers that they have at the uh, the Olympics. <clears throat> Now yes, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know uh, there's not a lot of places where athletes can actually get on a track and train in the United States. Um, and climate change is is threatening the future of your sport, including the the Winter Olympics. Um, there was an article in NPR that talks about how most of the places that have recently held the Winter Olympic Games, um, you know, in the future and, and up into the um, 2080s, may not even have the right climate to host the Winter Olympics in the future. So, talk to me about climate climate change. Um, and the conditions and, and how are you all planning and preparing for what's happening with global warming and climate change? Yeah. Yeah. I, unfortunately, climate change is, is having a, a negative impact on, on winter sports. And, and you think about, you know, much more broad, broadly than bobsled and skeleton. You're talking about the winter Olympic Games and, and downhill skiing and, and all those outdoor sports. And so um, you're absolutely right. The IOC is taking a look at where venues have have been placed and and where host countries have been, and they are recognizing that some are falling into a place where their winters are so short that they're either unpredictable or just not sustainable. And we're fortunate in the United States with the two um, cities who have hosted winter games in the past, Park City and Lake Placid, to be northern enough that they're not in that danger zone just yet. But but the the IOC and the Olympic movement is is looking at. Um, how do we ensure sustainability uh, within the sports? Um, one of the things that they're looking at is, is as opposed to continuing to add new cities um, to host Winter Olympic Games, because the cost is certainly a, um, something that they have to think about as well, um, but to limit the number of locations around the world. And they essentially move into a, a rotation where every four years, one of those four to five cities host those winter games and ensure that they're, they're at, a, at an elevation that's um, that's sustainable for the, for the future. Uh, for us specifically, one of the things that we've had to do is take a look at when do we start our season. And in the past, we, we started it uh, early October, and now we're starting to shift that back later into uh, later October, early November, and shift the season back. Fortunately, we haven't had to shorten the season yet, and, and hopefully we don't have to get to that point, but we're definitely shifting it throughout the year. Would the future potentially be training in other countries because there may not just not be the seasons too short for athletes to get enough time and practice uh, on the tracks? Uh, what do you what do you foresee changing in the future? Well, I'd say for for us, we're we are prepared for the future. Um, we're fortunate that that the the area around Lake Placid, the state has has uh, the state of New York has invested funds into Lake Placid and the legacy of those facilities. And they built what's called an indoor ice push track. And it's a it's an indoor freezer about 100 yards long 
that replicates the start of a bobsled or skeleton track. And so that allows athletes to train on ice year round. And so we have athletes in June, July, August that are pushing bobsled and skeleton sleds on ice in, in Lake Placid. And that's good for, for practice, right? But they can't get a full run. You can't have a full competition in that indoor type of environment. Do you see the sport of bobsled and skeleton moving to an indoor option? Or do you potentially see the, the sport becoming a more of a summer sport where there's instead of ice, you're using just a track and maybe wheels or something of that nature? Uh, potentially. We're not there yet. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to have a giant like hamster tunnel of a, of a mile long track that's refrigerated. So I think the cost could be prohibitive, prohibitive there. But I, I like what you, where you're thinking there. But hopefully we don't have to go there anytime soon. I think I think as a first step, we would, would have to reconsider and potentially shorten the season. Right now we have eight World Cup races with a World Championships or an Olympic Games at the end of the season. Uh, we may have to shorten that season, but but um, hopefully we we uh, get this climate climate change under control before that happens. Optimistic about the future yes. there. <laughs> Talk to me about optimism for para bobsled. I know that's one of the sports that you you sponsor. It's for athletes with disabilities, but it's not yet recognized as an Olympic sport. So talk to me about the future of para bobsled. Yeah, we've been fortunate. We've got some, we, we were one of the first countries to, to push for Parabop, uh, where we have uh, Paralympic athletes um, in, in bobsleds. And it's, it's a really cool sport because they sit in the sled, all the sleds are the same, and they have this, uh, this mechanical arm that pushes the sled at the very, very start. So every athlete gets the same start, same equipment, and it all comes down to driving. And so it's the best pilot wins the competition. And so right now we compete with a number of other countries around the world, and we're all pushing for Parabob to be part of the Paralympics. And it's not there yet, uh, but we're, we're hopeful that it will be uh, coming up soon in the Paralympics. Do you recruit athletes the same way for, for bobsled and parabobsled? We, we do. And, and, and so um, a, lot of times, a lot of times it's word of mouth. So you have one para bob athlete, para, para bob athlete who has a great time, and they reach out to their friend and say, "Hey, you gotta check this out." And so they're recruiting, um, not necessarily athletes who have come from other sports. Um, some of them have. We've got some some athletes who have competed in multiple Paralympics, but in other sports who are highly competitive in para bob. Um, but we are looking for athletes who are interested and, and again, willing to take that, that trip down the, the track, going 80, 90 miles an hour and say, how fast can I get back to the top of the track? Sounds awesome. Well, <laughs> good luck with the, the future uh, development of Parabob. And thanks for your time today and sharing with us about bobsled and skeleton and racing down the track. I appreciate your time, Aaron. Well, great. Really enjoyed it. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Our next episode will be Winky Day, who will discuss the sport of dragon boat racing. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.